There are many different kinds of mothers, and all are being honored today. For the mother who's chosen to stay at home while her children are little, may your patience be great and your influence even greater. For the single mom who never planned on doing this alone, may you be consistently strengthened by your Heavenly Father, and may you hear His voice singing over you. For the mother who strives to balance work outside the home with love inside the home, may you be given energy, validation, and hope as you make the leap from one world to another every day. For moms who had poor mothers themselves, but who now refuse to let that pattern repeat itself. May the godly legacy you've started be carried on for generations to come. For mothers with grown adult children, may today be filled with laughter and joy, and may you experience deep satisfaction and fulfillment. For women who have no biological children of their own, but who mother younger women as mentors, May you understand your role as a calling from God and as a transformation of their hearts. Today is a unique day, so for all the mothers we mentioned and even those we didn't, be blessed, be honored, be filled with joy. You are making the world a better place because you're filling it with a love that only a mom can give. Amen. Everybody agree with that? What a wonderful blessing. Boy, this has been just a blessed day. Happy Mother's Day to you all. My name is Ryan Schmitz. I'm the lead pastor here. And boy, it is great to spend Mother's Day with you today. Um, you have some chocolate on your lips right here, ma'am. I'm just seeing how many girls would do that after the chocolate fountain. I actually don't have anything. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Did you like the chocolate fountain and the ladies' lounge and all those things? That's great. That was the point. We wanted to honor you. I remember last year when we did that, there were like maybe five ladies that had these chocolate stains down their dress and their shirt, and they were just like wearing it proudly because they just were filled with chocolate. Um, but that was just a wonderful opportunity to bless you. That's the point of today, to honor you. In fact, how many of you here today want to obey God? Raise your hand if you want to obey God. Okay, how many of you want to live a long life? Okay. Well, if that's the case, then you need to honor your mother and your father. I mean, that's number five of the Ten Commandments that God gave us. If you want to obey God, you want to live a long life, obey, honor your mother and your father, and you will live a long life in the land. That's a promise from God. So that's what I want, and so that's what we're doing today. We want to honor you. Uh, we love you. Uh, we're so glad that you're here with us. So we're going to get back into our study of Genesis. We're going to spend some more time on our quest to study verse by verse through this whole book. Um, it's been wonderful. We've just started hitting Jacob's story, and uh, it's been pretty interesting. So far, what we have discovered is that it is quite clear that Jacob isn't living in submission to the Lord in this chapter of his life. We know that eventually he gets there. We see that in Hebrews 11, he's recorded as one of the patriarchs of the faith. But right now, Things are rough. Um, God has promised him his presence, his protection, his provision. Um, but he's also, behind the scenes, working in Jacob's life to purge him of some of his past to make him holy. And that's the same thing that he did for his grandfather, Abraham. Remember, his name was actually Abram. And God had to work with him for years and years and years to make him Abraham. Same thing with Isaac. A lot of time went into Isaac to make him the man of God he needed to be. And Quite frankly, it's the same sort of sanctification process for us today. That's what God does. Just as God has given us the promises to be with us everywhere he goes, he's also using our circumstances to direct us. He's using consequence to teach us. Remember that reap what you sow stuff. He's using difficult people in our life to humble us. And he's taking all the time that he needs to get it done because that's, his, that's what he wants to do in your life. He's a good father to you. And so he works on a um, eternal clock, okay? 
That's what God's doing. So today in our study of Genesis, we happen to fall upon the study of two moms. But I got to tell you, it's not really an uplifting Mother's Day story. Okay, remember, they're not really walking in submission to God right now. And so we're going to see a story today about two moms that are having a a pretty bad fight. It's kind of a dysfunctional family. In fact, we're going to see some stuff that we probably wouldn't read in public normally um, because it's just that. That weird. And as you get across, you come across stuff in scripture um, that's not always family friendly. We've had some of those experiences already in our study of Genesis, and today is no excuse. In fact, while God is in the process of purging his people, it often discloses the skeletons in our closet that he brings out the things that we come from in God's word to show us just how much grace means to us, how much grace is for us. So that's where we're at today, okay? Um, where we left off last week with Jacob, um, the deceiver was being deceived, remember, by his uncle, Laban. Um, he told him that he would serve him for seven years, and in return, he'd be able to marry his youngest uh, daughter, Rachel. The day came after seven years, and they had a big feast, and they went to bed, and early the next morning, guess who he was married to? His old, her older sister, Leah, right? And so, oh my gosh, that's quite a surprise. Um, totally deceived. After that, he was told that he had to work another seven years to marry Rachel. Uh, but in the meantime, he got to have her. And so now, here we're at, he's got two wives. And it's just something like out of a topic, out of one of those talk show, daytime soap opera things that we hear about and see on TV. I mean, it's just crazy what's going on. In fact, this is so wild that I can only imagine Imagine it as we look at it as being the topic of one of those daytime talk shows. And so I asked Ian, our resident skit writer, who's actually quite gifted at, at writing skits, if he could come up with something for this chapter to kind of get an idea of the, of, the, of the environment that this is being in. And so he did not disappoint. So we actually have a skit for you today. Um, it's caught, and we're going to do that for you. And- Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of Speaking Truth. I'm your host, Jerry Maya Springer, and today we have a very interesting guest for our show. You might remember him from that bestseller book. Hey, that soup was so good, I sold my birthright. And you might have also heard him from that memorable Broadway hit, Yeah, it's me, Esau. Please help me welcome Jacob Isaacson. Everyone give him a hand, Jacob Isaacson. Come on up here. Jacob Isaacson, nice to meet you, sir. (laughs) Oh, sorry. Okay. All right, thank you, Jacob. Let's set the scene here for you right now. Okay, here you are. You're in a tough jam, okay? Um, You're running from Esau. You had a bad moment with him. Okay, let's, let's start there and go from there, okay? Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, Esau was pretty sore (laughs) with me getting dad's blessing. Um, So my mother suggested, hey, why don't you take a long vacation, you know, let Esau Uh cool off a little bit. And uh, dad said, well, why don't you go to Padan Aram, find Mm -hmm. yourself a nice lady to settle down with. So off I went. So that's quite a bit north. So you got to Haran, you're there, everything is going as, as planned. What happens from there? Well, I was looking for some water. I was thirsty. And uh, I came across this well. Mm. But there was a stone on top of it, and it was so big that it was going to take more than one person that's, to pull it off. That's common in the area. Yeah. Mm. So, so I, I waited, and eventually some, uh, some shepherds showed up, and we started talking, and uh, <laughs> that's when I saw her. <laughs> her oh, oh, Rachel. Talking about Rachel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Rachel. Woo. Uh, (laughs) I I tell you what, uh, when I laid eyes on her, man, I felt this energy come over me. And uh, (laughs) so much that I went over and I pulled that stone off that well all by myself. (laughs) That's right. Uh, I just, I just, I couldn't control myself. So I ran over to her. And uh, I gave her a big kiss, and uh, uh, and, and, and then I explained to her a little forward. Well, well, I listen. I explained to her that her father was my uncle. That doesn't make it any better, actually, from this point. (laughs) 
Um, okay, so let me stop here. Let me stop. How did you react? How did she react? Uh, she ran away. Oh! <laughs> well, hold on. It's not like oh. you think. No. All right. So next thing I know, Laban shows up, and he hugged and kissed me, and uh, we went back to his house, and we caught up on things. Okay, great. Now let's fast forward a little bit. You're spending a month with him. Everything is hunky-dory. I mean, everything is going well. Um, what happens now? Well, one day he comes to me and he says, uh, listen, it's only right that I should pay you for the work you've been doing. So he says, how much should I pay you? Well, I had heard that Laban could be a little difficult to negotiate with when mm. it came to money. Uh, so I had this idea. It was an amazing idea. I said, listen, I'll work for you. For seven years, you let me marry Rachel. Sounds fair, I, I guess. Um, yeah, so uh, Rachel wasn't Laban's only daughter, though, right? No. No, Laban had two daughters. <laughs> Rachel was the younger of okay, the two. Okay, and the older one, from what I understand, is Leah. So based on your time that you spent with that family, what was your impression of Leah? Leah was, uh, let me see, safe. safe. She was safe, okay. yeah. Uh, she wasn't very outgoing. I mean, listen, I wanted a little excitement in my life. <laughs> and as nice as Leah was. 77 years old, I mean, you might as well. Hey, yeah. that, that's young. That's young. And, and as nice as Leah was, exciting, not a word that I would use to describe her. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hold on. <laughs> hey, I said she was nice. Come on. Uh, Rachel, on the other hand, Rachel, she was always looking for the next big thing to try. Okay, yeah. Uh, very, she was shepherdish, right? Yeah, that's great. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you stay in your work for Laban seven years, just go like that, you said. Now what? Yeah, those seven years uh, flew right on by. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, next thing, you know, it comes the big day, right? And, and I mean, it, it seemed like the seven years didn't even happen because I, I knew what the outcome was going to be. Mm. I was going to get Rachel. Yeah. So, so there was this big party. The whole town showed up for this party. And uh, it, all right, I'll admit, I may have partied a little bit too much. Okay. But, but that does not excuse what happened. So after the party, I went back to our chambers, and I, I turned the lights down low, you know, make it nice and romantic. Like a candle? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Let's keep yeah, it I PG, please. I only had one candle, not okay. ten. All okay. right, so. <laughs> so, so it, it was dark, right? So you can't really blame me for what happened. Mm -hmm. Right? So, mm -hmm. so we, you know, Mm. Uh, uh, hey. mm. so, please, 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 mm -hmm. please stop. <laughs> oh, sorry. So we're getting ready to consummate the marriage. You know, night goes by. Next morning I wake up. It's Leah in my bed, okay? It's not oh! Rachel, it's Leah. Oh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah. <laughs> All right, so... So I immediately went to Laban and I said, what did you do? Hmm. <laughs> Please stay calm in the well, audience, ma'am. It just so happens, folks, that we have Laban backstage and he's been listening the whole time. Let's get him out here. Let's him explain what he did on this side. Sorry, Laban, come on. Everyone, welcome Laban. Come on up, up Laban. Stage, please, welcome. Here, be here, Friday prayer show. Come on out, please. Welcome very much. Glad to be here. Thank you. Hey, before we get started, uh, are you going to validate my parking? Validate your parking? Yeah. It, it's a camel. Come sit down. Cheapskate, sit down. Keep it. Okay. Good night. Sit. Okay. Okay, Levon, why don't you tell us your side of the story here? Uh, he's, we've, you've been listening this whole time. Let's hear what you have to say. Yeah. All right. Well, 
You sure you want to hear what I have to say? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure the security guy wants to hear what I have to say. <laughs> All right. I want to hear what you have to say. All right. So, all right, let me explain. I know he painted a bad picture about me, but this guy, let me tell you, he's actually a pretty good worker. He worked hard, and, you know, I probably should have kept up my end of the bargain we, on what we agreed on, but he wanted Rachel, my youngest. First of all, we don't do it that way in our country. We don't marry off the younger daughter before the older. Which he failed to mention. Well, listen... I don't think he got that bad of a deal, right? You know, yeah. I told him, enjoy your week with, with Leah, and you know, then maybe I'll give you Rachel too. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but that wasn't it. He said I had to work another seven years. Ooh. Yeah, talk about pulling off the ultimate bait and switch. <laughs> what can I say? He was a great worker, and, you know, it's not like daughters grow on trees. <laughs> oh, boy. So eventually, you got Rachel also, okay? But everything wasn't perfect, was it? <laughs> well, listen, <laughs> when you have two wives... Hey, these are my daughters you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you care. Okay. <laughs> I see. When you have two wives... Eventually, one of them will feel ignored or left out. It just happens. Mm -hmm. I did my best to treat them equally, but Leah felt unloved. Then it happened. It happened? What's that? What happened? Leah got pregnant with Reuben. Oh, little Reuben. wow, good. I That's, love little Reuben. Uh, how, how did Rachel react to that? <laughs> At first, she was happy. Then it happened again. And again. A and again. And again. And again. And again. <laughs> yeah, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Well, Good. by that time, you can imagine Rachel was pretty upset. She pretty much assumed that I was spending a little bit too much time with Leah, if you know what I mean. I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. so, so she comes to me, and she says... Hey, you need to get me pregnant with a boy. And I looked at her. I said, am I God? I said, am I the one who refused you babies? Well, I think we need to hear from Leah herself. Don't you, folks? <laughs> Guys, we have another surprise. Walking backstage is, um, oh, Rachel. Let's bring Rachel out first. Rachel, come on out, Rachel. Rachel, we're going to bring Rachel out. None other than Rachel. Let's welcome Rachel. Guys, give her a hand here. Thank you, Rachel, for coming out. We appreciate you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, Rachel, why don't you tell us what you're thinking through this? You've been listening to this whole account. Oh, well. Congratulations, I, by the way. It's, well, you're pregnant. Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't figure out why God had cursed me and blessed my sister so much. I've been faithful. I've always tried to do the right thing, not to mention how much younger I am. <laughs> so I only had one choice. I gave my maidservant Bilha to Jacob as a surrogate. Oh, Jacob, what'd you think about that? I know what he thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, well, honestly, Jeremiah, uh, you try arguing with her and see how that works. <laughs> all right. Oh, oh, okay. Well, Bilha got pregnant then. Okay, right, Rachel? Yes, I'd finally given a son to my husband, and his name was Dan. God heard my cries, and he blessed me. Little Danny. Oh, so that was it, right? Oh, no. Leah had given Jacob four sons, and I only had one. This wasn't over by a long shot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bilha got pregnant again with Naphtali, and I had shown her who was the better wife. I'd given him his last two sons, and then she made it personal. Hmm. Well, should we hear from Leah too, folks? Yeah. Leah, why don't we get Leah to come out here and let's have her tell Leah. the rest of the story. Leah, come on out, Leah. Oh, thank you. Give Leah a hand for coming out. Thank you so much. Welcome to the show. She's a little shy. She's a little shy. That's okay. Welcome. I'd like to have you here. I wanted to see you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So how did you feel when, about Rachel providing the last two sons for Jacob, Leah? Well, well, how was I supposed to feel? Even though I'm the older daughter, Rachel always got all the attention. Older. <laughs> Leah's the responsible one. I'm sure she's father's favorite, even though he won't say it to my face. And it's obvious that she's Jacob's favorite. All I wanted was something to make me special. <laughs> Thank you for understanding. But no, let's have fun. Rachel had to have her own babies, and I wasn't going to stand for that. Okay, so what did you do then? Well, I did what any wife in my position would do. I thought that my days of having babies were over. Mm. Older. <laughs> Enough from the peanut gallery, thank you. So, I gave my maidservant Zilpah as Jacob's wife, and she did not disappoint. She became pregnant and provided him with Gad. But for me, that was not enough. He was a handful. Yeah, yeah. Well, but we still needed more, because more is always better, Dad. So once again, Zilpah went with Jacob and became pregnant with Asher. And I thought, surely this will prove that I am the better wife and I am more loved. Mm. Okay, so Rachel... Let's move a little bit further here. Why don't you tell me about the issue with the, the, the scene with the mandrakes? Oh, that oh, trap. <laughs> well, one day Leah's son Reuben came home with some mandrake fruit, and it looked and smelled so good, I just had to have some. So I asked Leah, and she reacted the way that you would expect. Isn't it enough you took my husband? Now you have to have my mandrakes too? <laughs> So I offered her a deal. So, so Jacob, tell us, tell us what happened that night then. <laughs> all right, so, so, so I've been out working all day. I'm tired. Good I'm, worker, by the way. Yeah. So I come home. All I'm thinking about is I, I want to come inside, sit down for a little bit. Next thing I know, Leah is standing in front of me, and she says, Tonight you're sleeping with me. I bought you with my son's mandrakes. <laughs> I mean, I thought she was crazy at first, uh, but hey, this is my daughter. Well, it didn't take long for me to figure out what she was talking about, if you mm, know what I mean. Okay, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> and I was blessed with my fifth son, Issachar. Issachar. Then she did it again. And again. Her sixth son, Zebulon. I know you cheated. Oh, Zebby. Cheated? How can you fake um, something like that? You're just jealous because I'm the better Zebby, wife. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ridiculous. Oh, girls, girls, oh, girls. Don't embarrass me in front of all these people. I've don't. got my reputation to... Oh, my gosh, stake. don't even start. We wouldn't be having this problem if it weren't for you. And more yeah. women... Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. More women? Seriously, that'll be the day. My mistake was trusting you in the first place, and I should have never taken those stupid mandrakes. They were good, though. <laughs> but you did, and I had Issachar, and then Zebulon, and then to finish off the contest, God blessed me with a beautiful daughter, little Dinah. Oh, finally, a beautiful little girl. <laughs> Well, don't forget who has the last laugh, as you can see. Oh, oh my goodness, you look like a kangaroo. Am, you should name him little Joey. I am going to name him Joseph. I am pregnant with the final son. Oh. So, so many, we could make a whole nation out of these grandkids. Are you going to be quiet? I win, and he likes me more. Excellent. Very he good. Mm -hmm. He does. He likes me more. Yes, he does. Ladies, ladies, there's plenty of Jacob to go around. 
this has nothing to do with you. Not not you. We're talking about God. God likes me more. Uh, no, he doesn't. Well, I'm okay. Anyway, I have um, more children. Clearly. we do have one more surprise for you. It is being Mother's Day, and you do have so many children. The children decided to send you a little gift today and bring you some flowers. Everyone, oh, how say, sweet. let's look at these flowers. Oh, so, we want to welcome them yeah. Mother's Day. Yes. These are beautiful flowers for them. There you go. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, oh there. Beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. Oh my, would look you at look at that. how many flowers I have? Oh no. So many more than my sister. Oh. No, 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 no. Look at how much more beautiful mine are. They're roses. They have cost so much more than your wildflowers. Yeah. I think they But my them dear, you have to agree that quantity is always more important. It just shows you how much all my many children love me as opposed to your couple of kids. Oh, boy. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. The only obvious thing here is my children understand quality over quantity, and they spent a lot more money to show me their love. More will always be better. Well, we'll see. I still have my best years ahead of me. Oh, well, we'll see. Okay. Well, okay. Well, oh, well, well, uh, okay. well um, there you have it there, uh, right. folks. Um, so many sons of Jacob and his four wives, and you thought one wife was difficult, right? Hey, thanks for watching another episode of Speaking Truth. I'm Jeremiah Springer. Have a great day. Thank you very much. <laughs> and give our, give our skip people a hand, too, please. That was really great. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good. Hey, we just wanted to do that to show you kind of just the craziness of the situation. And, and uh, it, we, we covered about 24 verses in this to talk about just the occasion of what happened within this family. Um, I want to show you all the different names of the people on the, on the board here. Do you have the next, next slide here? Go to the next one, please. This is all of the different kids that eventually make up a two million person tribe by the time Moses was writing this. There was going to be a 13th son um, later on after Joseph. Remember, they, they, they think that he has died and goes off into, into slavery. Oh, my glasses. Thank you. And, uh, and they have Benjamin later on. And uh, Dinah is actually sets us up for chapter 34, which is just another horrendous uh, account of what happens to her as well. Um, God ja bless Jacob with a 11 sons, one daughter, 12th one on the way. This is really a case study of a family at war. Uh, family conflict is nothing new. It's not a new phenomenon. It's been happening for a long, long time. Uh, in fact, the very first fight that we see in Scripture is between a man and his wife in the Garden of Eden, talking about who is at fault for who for eating the fruit. Now, as a pastor, I have the high honor of being with people in some of the most difficult parts of their life and counseling people. I've had so many different stories come across my desk, and I've gotten to the point where nothing surprises me anymore in ministry. And what I thought about with this week was to think about this account as this family. What I'd like for you to do for just the last part of our time together is I'd like for you to become pastors for a minute, and I want you to imagine that you have this couple, or these a lot of people, four, four wives, four women, and, and Jacob comes to your office and describes this story for you. It's your job as the pastor to counsel them, okay? How would you counsel this family in this situation today? Um, there's a lot going on here, isn't there? Let's start with Jacob. When you're counseling somebody, you often have to come up with identifying the issues first and then going into how to bring solution to those issues. So any Identities, any problems that you can identify right off the bat? Okay, yeah, that's kind of a big one, right? The polygamy thing, all right? Let's start with that. Polygamy is an issue. Now, it's, it's not God's original plan. The word for polygamy, it just means two-timing. So you get the root idea for that from our, our culture today. And in our culture, we don't have the polygamy lifestyle that we would have in that day and age, okay? And that's, that's just something we don't deal with in that way. But there are many Americans that live polygamy 
polygamous, all right? Because polygamy is when you have several partners. And there are people who go from partner to partner to partner, sexual relationship after sexual relationship. And in fact, the culture around us applauds that lifestyle and even champions people and crowns people that has that sort of lifestyle and says, this is the way you're supposed to do it. That's a polygamous mindset. There are many people today that treat divorce. Not all people, but many people treat divorce with a polygamous mindset, which means I just don't like who I married, and so I'm just going to dump them and get another one. All right, look at Hollywood today and all of those relationships that are coming and going constantly within that. Some people have polygamous mindsets. All right, let me be honest with you guys today. Any of you guys that know this account or listening to this story, how many of you were like, Jacob's got it pretty good. I mean, he's got four girls to deal with here. You know, how has he got it wrong? You know, I was one of those. Um, that's a polygamy mindset. There are people out there that even though they're married, they are constantly looking around. They're constantly setting their mind to other people. They're constantly, they flirt, whatever it might be. These are the things that are issues and will cause issues in relationships. And Jacob is dealing with this right now, okay? This is called the desires of the flesh. You were not supposed to gratify the desires of the flesh. We are supposed to gratify the desires of the spirit. That's one of the problems. The other one, I heard someone else say it too, is Jacob needs to own his stuff, doesn't he? He needs to take responsibility for his family. And one of the pieces of advice that I would give Jacob, if we were pastors together, would be that you need to take responsibility for the direction of your family under God. Guys, this is heavily attacked today, but God has set up and he clearly teaches in the word of God that the man is the head of the family. And with that comes responsibility. This just means that under the authority of God, he has given a man a role to be the head of the family. This in no way means that he is superior. In no way means that he is dominating. But instead, he is responsible. He is accountable. One accountable is always under the authority of Christ accountable to him. The main concept of authority in general is not about power. It's about responsibility. It's about using that responsibility well. So what I would tell the Jacob is, are you praying for your family? What are you doing to deal with these issues? Have you sought the Lord for instruction in any of these things? We saw in the first 30 verses last week that he didn't mention God once. Did you step in and stop the fighting between your, between your wives? You know, this is a job of a leader to help resolve problems, not let them continue. God holds you accountable. Behind the scenes, we get a view of this. We know why Rachel was barren, because in the first 31, it tells us that um, the Lord saw that Leah was neglected or Leah was unloved, and so he made Rachel barren, okay? And what I think is significant about that is that the Lord sees every family and every problem in every family, And I think that's great. Behind the scenes, he is working. And he prevented Rachel from having children until this major problem in this family could be fixed. Okay? And that's what God does. This is not the first time God has used that in this family. Remember Sarai? Sarah, she was barren for years and years and years until her and her husband Abram could trust, learn to trust God. Isaac and Rebecca, they were barren for 25 years until they learned to trust God. God permitted Commits these kinds of things in order to teach us and to depend, to depend on him and seek him, okay? The other thing that I think of advice that I would give him is husbands are responsible to love their wife as Christ sacrificially loved the church. And that's also the command that comes with leadership. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Guys, listen, the church isn't always lovely, But God always loves her. And that's the same thing with our women in our life. God's grace towards us should be that we model his love in the way that we treat each other, okay? Your job as a husband is to view your wife with the view of her becoming all that God wants her to be. So if you want to demonstrate that Christ-like love, you want to love the women in your life today, men, 
Love them sacrificially. Put their needs before your own. That'll make you the leader of your house. Okay, that's what it is. Now let's look at Leah and Rachel, okay? Let's counsel them. If you could think of some advice to give Leah, what would you give them? You're the pastor here. Identify some issues. There's some serious manipulation going on here. There's some jealousy. There's some rivalry going on here. There's some fighting. Here's what I would tell Leah. I'd say, Leah, you are looking for love in all the wrong places, okay? There's some serious issue here with Leah. No offense, uh, Carrie. You did a great job, by the way. Uh, here's, here's the thing, you guys. Leah was in on this whole deception thing with her dad. She was on board at the marriage night. You know, now sure, she was listening to her dad. You had to be obedient in that day and age. You had to follow the cultural norms of that age. She was the oldest. She had to get married first. But she was all on board. She did not once pipe up and say, hey, we shouldn't deceive him like that. In fact, she started her relationship with Jacob based on a lie, based on manipulation, Okay, this is what's happening. And now Leah is frustrated because she doesn't have the intimacy she thought her manipulation would bring her. That is crazy. And you know what? This happens today. And this is sad to me. It's sad reality for a lot of ladies today. Many ladies longing for love, longing for connection, think that if they could just manipulate God's plan for marriage, and give the man the intimacy that she has before the security of marriage, then she'll have him, and he'll have to love her, okay? And that is a frequently used thought in our culture today, all right? And the world applauds that. That's what Leah thought. Even they started having kids, she thought, man, surely now this would win his heart. And we see that throughout the dialogue of scripture. She has Reuben and he sa- she says, well, now he'll love me. He looks at Simeon and says, now the Lord heard I was unloved and gave me this one. Now he's for sure he'll be attached to me. He has Levi and she said, great, now Jacob has got to love me. Leah was trying to create love with sex and kids. Guys, it doesn't work that way. You've got to go to the author and the creator of love to experience it. But unfortunately, so many ladies think the other way. And that's why there's so much brokenness and so much dysfunction and so much hurt. She was looking for love in the wrong place. If I could talk to Leah, I would say, Leah, give your heart to God first. Let, her meet the, let him meet the deepest needs of your life and the intimate parts of your life. And then once your heart is secure in God, model that in the relationship that you have with your husband, your relationship with God. Okay? How about Rachel? What advice would you give Rachel? What was her issue, do you think? There was one part in Scripture she said, I wrestled with my, my, my sister and I have won. I am so excited. She had some serious rivalry going on. It tells us in Scripture that she was extremely envious and jealous of her sister and uh, all the children she had. In fact, Rachel saw that she bore Jacob some children and she sat jealous of her and said, give me children or else I will die. Rachel needs to learn a lesson on submission. Okay, Rachel was so desperately jealous of Leah's fruitfulness that she demanded children. So she took matters into her own hands and she used the local cultural norm to make that happen, okay? She did exactly what Sarah did with her maidservant, Hagar. And remember how well that went with Ishmael? Okay, she's following right along with that. This was a cultural thing at the time. If your wife was barren, then in order to preserve the namesake for your family, their maidservant would be given even as a wife, they would have a child as if this was your child. And so you would have the lineage continue. Now, here's the issue, okay? Was Jacob's lineage in jeopardy here? Okay, that's the interesting thing. You know, see, when Sarah made that proposal with Abraham, they had no children. Go back to chapter 16 and read it. Here's the difference. Jacob already had several sons through Leah. So while Sarah's proposal was, to de- was out of desperate measures, Rachel's proposal stemmed from her own pride and her own jealousy. She just had to have children of her own. She had to take every steps necessary to get them. 
James 4 explains why this happens. It says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not ask because you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you spend what you get on your own pleasures. See, Jake, Rachel was more worried about winning than about marriage. Her priorities were out of order. Marriage is not, was not about love, it was about status. It was about winning. It was about being the best. She has to deal with fighting and jealousy for what it is in her life. She's got to recognize it as sin and get rid of it. So here's this family, folks. Here's what they're dealing with. This family is dealing with past mistakes, dealing with deception, dealing with manipulation, dealing with lying to each other, dealing with rivalry, dealing with fighting, dealing with blame, with jealousy, with cultural pressures, including polygamy, the right to impregnate maidservants, and on top of all of that, they have major in-law problems. Okay, you as a counselor, you ready to take that case on? I mean, that is wild, isn't it? I don't know if there's a counselor in this world that would want to take that. So what do they need? They need the wonderful counselor. They need the Prince of Peace. Guys, this is the point. This is the point that God is making through this, this story. The point where someone says, I need the Lord. I have no other way than you. Sometimes God allows people to hit rock bottom before reality sets in and they need God. And that's where he's taking this family, even though he's with them. And this is where grace comes in because this is where grace and God does his best work. God works in the rock bottom. He never leaves us. He takes the most broken in our lives and he makes us whole. He takes the shattered glass of our life and turns it into a stained glass window. He's able to take the pressures of our life and use them to make diamonds. He's able to diagnose and remedy our marriages and our home. And so if I could, I would sit down with this family and I would give them advice and I think it's good advice for us too today. I would say, listen, if we violate God's principles for family, we will have negative issues, period. Negative issues will come. That's how it works. Own your stuff. If you have a past, if you have issues, if you have problems with sin in general, if the world says, hey, do it this way and just do whatever we say, don't deal with it. Take care of it. Do what God wants you to do. Don't let stuff fester in your life. Break the cycle of issues in your life. Give it to the Lord in repentance and fill that space that it once occupied in your family and in your marriage with the Holy Spirit. The other thing I would tell them, is God should have full access into your house. I love what Joshua says, I think in chapter 24 of his book, he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, at every wedding that I officiate, I get the privilege of doing that, I stand on behalf of God. And the reason why I go to these weddings is because the couple wants God to bless their marriage. They want to start their relationship out with God's blessing. And they say, make sure you pray that God blesses our marriage at our ceremony. And I tell them, I said, listen, for God's blessing to work, he's got to be invited way beyond the ceremony. He's got to be in every part of your life. He's got to be in your house. There is this verse that says like three, story, three strands of cord are not easily broken. And he's talking about the husband and the wife or we apply it to that. And how when you weave and braid your life around the principles in Jesus Christ, your life will be stronger. Your marriage will be stronger. If your family has a smattering of spirituality, that means you're just not living day to day on the lordship of Christ, then you will not experience the full blessing of God, okay? You need to obey him, not just talk to him. You need to walk with him, not just walk by him. You need to read the word every single day and submit to him in everyday matters of your life. This last one, I saved the best for last, okay? I really, really like this one. Sex, marriage, love, and family can never be fully satisfying unless enjoyed within the will of God and the word of God. 
Now that's a big statement, okay? And I want to say this to you again. Sex, love, marriage, and family can never be fully satisfying unless enjoyed within the will of God and the word of God. Now, how can I be so bold to say something like that? It's because those four areas that almost everybody in the world is pursuing are direct references to God himself, gifts from God, given by God to point to God. Does that make sense? Every one of those things are an extension of God himself. Sex is an extension of God. He designed it. He designed it for us. He gave us the parameters of which to use. He said, do this. It's going to be pleasurable. You guys are going to be, it's, it says, be intoxicated with the love that you have with one another. It's the ultimate sense of intimacy. It's the ultimate sense of oneness as God is one. And it's also part of procreation. You are creating alongside of God when you do sex, okay? Love is God himself, It's an extension of God. We understand love because we understand God. Marriage was created and defined by God. He sustains marriage. It's modeled after his love and his commitment to us. In fact, he calls us the bride of Christ. And one day, we're going to have this marriage supper of the lamb in heaven. God's invention. Family is God's invention. How does God choose to describe himself? He is the father, right? And Jesus is the son, right? And we are his sons and daughters, right? We are a family of God. This is God's invention. Listen, these things cannot be complete apart from God himself. Understand that. And you can disagree with me, but you can be wrong. Because this is what God's word says. You will never fully understand the gratifying desires of these things apart from God. And no wonder sin corrupts these things the most. No no wonder so many people attribute love to brokenness and hurt. So many people attribute family to dysfunction. So many people attribute marriage to insecure and selfishness and all these different things because the devil and sin has corrupted these four areas of life and we've taken them away from God. We've got to go to God. So let's close and we'll sing a song and we'll pray and thank you guys for your time. Very difficult passage to go through um, and I hope that you'll talk more about it in your connect group tonight. Let's pray. God, thanks for this time together and uh, Lord, Um, I'm just grateful for the chance to use creativity. Thank you for Ian um, writing that great skit. And um, God, I'm thankful that you see every area of our life and that you see the issues, you see, you know our families. In fact, you designed them. You knit them together in our mother's womb. And God, we are so grateful that you have this part of our life. But God, we also understand that within the process that we have from being from going from the people we were to the people we need to be, there are moments that you have to refine us. And God, I would pray that in those times, in our families, we would seek you first diligently, that we would understand that we don't get to invent how stuff works, that you do, that you are the creator and sustainer of this. God, I would ask, Lord, that you would please help us to learn these lessons by looking at Jacob's life and the issues with polygamy. They do look at Leah's life and the issue of just wanting to be loved and looking for love in the wrong places. Look at Rachel and her desire to win and to have legacy. God, may she find that in you and may we find that in you. And God, may we take our families and our life and offer them to you, giving you every access to every part of our life, even the stuff that we have hidden in our closets and stuff like that. Help us, God, to own our stuff. And Lord God, I want to ask for a blessing over the mothers today here. May they be honored and, and, and cherished today. We worship you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.